Welcome back to the State of the Union Conference. We carry on with our afternoon sessions here at the European University Institute. On the 21st of September 2020, World had a state and governments unanimously committed to an ambitious political declaration for the 75th anniversary of the United Nation. Now, what's been happening since then? That's what we're going to be discussing at this next session, which is moderated by Alexander Stutzman, Special Advisor to the President of the United Nations General Assembly. Thank you very much, Sasha. Good evening, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, dear friends of the State of the Union, uh, of the EU and of the UN, it's a pleasure to be with all of you this afternoon. Um, welcome to this panel on a reinvigorated multilateralism for the future we want with the UN we need. With us this afternoon, a very distinguished panel um, that I'm going to have the pleasure to introduce right now with impressive experience uh, both at UN and EU level for many of you, but also a very solid background and expertise on the areas that we will be discussing. With us, we have Isabelle Durand, Acting Secretary General of the uh, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development in Geneva. Uh, Isabelle, you were former Prime, Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium, former parliamentarian, Vice President of the European Parliament, but also most importantly, I want to say, a very active uh, civil society um, engager at, uh, throughout your political career, making sure that the voice of the people is heard when it comes to policy making. With us as well, Cristina Galach Figueras, State Secretary of State uh, for Foreign Affairs uh, in Spain. Uh, Cristina, before entering politics, uh, you have had a long experience and solid experience both at the EU and at the UN as a spokesperson of the very first High Representative for Foreign Policy uh, and, for, and Security Policy, but as well as Under Secretary General for Communication and Information at the United Nations. With us today as well, Natalie Samarazinge. Uh, Natalie, you are the executive director of the UN Foundation in um, UN Association, sorry, uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, you have a long-standing experience in the realm of civil society, in grassroots movements, and involvement in UN affairs. Uh, but also, you were the chief strategist last year in 2020 of the UN 75 campaign of the UN Secretary General. And last but not least, Volker Turk uh, with us today, Assistant Secretary General for Strategic Coordination in the Executive Office of the Secretary General in New York City, where among the many other tasks that you are um, monitoring, following and doing, you also have this important file of the implementation of the UN 75 strategy and declaration. Uh, Volker, you have a long-standing career in uh, the UN Civil Service uh, with the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, both in the field and in Geneva at headquarters. Um, you've tackled very serious files there. Uh, one of them that is well, most known to all of us is the Global Compact for Migration, not that long ago, but you also have, and this is the Univers University Institute in Florence here, an academic background and an academic career in the field of international law and human rights law. Now, this being a virtual event, uh, we have, of course, a virtual audience, and I invite everyone from that virtual audience to participate acti actively in the chat that is accessible to the platform, and as well maybe to answer, if you feel like it, but please go ahead, the poll questions that we've put uh, on the platform about the effectiveness of the United Nations, and we shall look at the result of those polls um, in due course during our discussion. Um, Let's get back and into the substance. Uh, in 2020, as was alluded to, in the middle of a global pandemic, the UN celebrated its 75th anniversary, a rather low-key anniversary given the circumstances, but nevertheless, the opportunity to both look back at achievements, or some would say the non-achievements of the United Nations over those decades, but as well looking forward uh, and taking the lessons learned from the past to see 
uh, how we could courageously, uh, while listening to the voices coming from behind, and those voices are member states, of course, but also thinkers in their various diversity, um, civil society, and most importantly, youth, how this could all be incorporated into what would become the vision, the course of action for the United Nations in the years ahead. Circumstances, COVID-19, have shown that international cooperation is more crucial, more needed than ever nowadays. Challenges, old and new, do accumulate. We know them. The UN, United Nations were created for that. Peace and security, eradication of poverty. Uh, but we also see today climate change, sustainable development goals, the digital divide, and most important and often forgotten, the underlying human rights dimension to all of those questions. Like the EU, the UN was created to answer them as effectively as possible because those organizations share the same values, the same objectives, the same DNA. They should also come up together with similar solutions. Therefore, the questions are, are these organizations in the current context able? Are they equipped well enough to fight and overcome those challenges? Are they listening to their environment and are they including what they hear or could hear into their way of doing and in their policy making. Therefore, first question to all of you in order to set the scene of our panel discussion today about the UN 75 strategy and campaign, which was a real attempt by the UN system, by member states, by the Secretary General, by the General Assembly, to listen to the outside world in order to, to define the course of actions for the years and the decades ahead. The Secretary General talks about a new social contract, the need to restore trust, the need to inspire hope. Leaders adopted the declaration in September, uh, world leaders adopted the declaration in September last year, and which is an ambitious text. Now is the time to deliver. What is in your organization the delivery? How do you in your respective capacity, deliver on UN 75. And maybe I start with you, Christina. Uh, Spain is actively involved as a member state in this implementation process. How do you see that? And I would then move to Natalie, who's been at the helm of the 2020 campaign well, from her perspective, but also, uh, uh, sorry, the, 20, the 75th um, campaign in, the, in 2020. Moving then to Isabel uh, to give us the perspective from Geneva uh, as what multilateralism means there. And finally, Volker, who's the man in charge in the Secretary General's Executive Office. Tell us more about the steps ahead. Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, I'll be very brief because we don't have much time. And uh, I think it's good that we all engage uh, uh, in, a, in a good discussion. Um, we took very seriously the 75th uh, declaration that the Secretary General and the member states uh, you know, approved, because we take very seriously in the Spanish government multilateralism. So what we did a month after, our prime minister gathered a, a smaller group of heads of the state and government representing the different continents, altogether over 12, uh, 13 of them, and they went over. Uh, in, a, in a rather agile discussion, the key issues on which we had to work decisively. And uh, we identified a few of them, and I think it's good that I, I tell them which they are and what we have been doing. The first one was uh, to, to definitely take uh, very seriously the 2030 agenda, the SDGs, and understand that uh, the ambition we had set for us because of COVID, because of what the world was going through, we needed to reinvigorate what we were going, what we were doing in order to implement and in order to achieve the uh, implementation of, of the goals. And one very practical idea that was put at the table and we are working on is uh, to adopt a multi-dimensional uh, poverty index as a matrix to better measure progress, understanding that we have all fall behind, in particular those countries that are weak. Second area of work that is already enshrined in the 75th uh, declaration is health. And on that, we work uh, uh, on a number of uh, areas, mm -hmm. in particularly making universal 
health care coverage. This is critical. And I think what we are doing now with our bilateral cooperation with countries and we are doing collectively is important. Third area of work, environment and energy transition. Um, as, for example, we have adopted in Spain a very strong um, uh, environment and energy transition law and uh, working with uh, other member states, in particular, this is a smaller group that we gather. Fourth, gender. Gender critical, not only women, peace and security, but the gender equality agenda. What we did ourselves is to adopt a feminist foreign policy and structure a number of very specific actions on, on gender. And fifth, and I think you will understand why migration. Migration in order to support a safe, orderly, regular migration as a means of reducing um, global inequality. So these were five areas that the, um, the group of countries that met uh, as a follow-up of the 75th anniversary declaration uh, agreed to, and we, we move on with them. I think in all the areas we, as a Spain, we are working hard. On top of that, we were able to um, uh, uh, increment our financial support to key international organizations and funds and programs of the UN that were in greatest need. UNRWA, for example, uh, UN Women, IOM, UNHCR, etc. So uh, uh, even considering that uh, our, our resources are limited to make an extra mile, uh, to explain to our public opinion that uh, even in moments of difficulty internally, it is complex for everybody. Spain uh, GDP has fallen. We have uh, right. uh, uh, ratios of uh, unemployment which have been growing, but we need to commit and to work in order to reinforce all our multilateralism and the strength of the multilateralist organizations. We will continue. So I think it so, is so just a, a great signal and we want to, to be on top of the uh, our international obligations. Over to you. Thank you. So no reason to disengage and very hands-on, very pragmatic approach uh, with very concrete action. Isabel, I'm pretty sure that in Geneva, this is a similar approach that you share. Uh, for sure, for sure. And um, I would add the fact that uh, Geneva is sometimes perceived as uh, um, another place far from New so York. Is this better now? Uh, sorry, um, I continue, Alex? Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So just to, uh, Geneva is far from New York. New York is the center and the headquarter of, uh, of the UN. But in Geneva, we are building the multilateral, the concrete multilateralism. We are building that with, of course, trade, trade and development as the case is the case for UNCTAD, but also but WHO, of course, health and COVID shows uh, how important it is. Also WIPO, that's an organization not well known regarding intellectual property, but that's key, especially in the vaccine and vaccination issue. There was also a, a lot of organizations, I, I think, to the, the meteorological uh, uh, organization uh, working about uh, alert for tsunami and all those issues which are changing really concretely the life of the people. It's not exactly because of the 75th anniversary. Nevertheless, I think that Geneva is probably a, a base where we can try to build or rebuild trust rebuild concrete issues which could change the life of the people. Even if, of course, I agree with Christina on all the important issues that she mentioned. Nevertheless, showing that well, in Geneva, it's not because it's in Geneva, but those organizations of the UN system are providing a lot of standard rules. Uh, and we know how important it is in this COVID period where we feel that uh, COVID-19, but also climate change, digitalization, all the challenge of digitalization are also something which is in the common agenda of the Secretary General. We have to have maybe a new Geneva Convention on digitalization rules and common goods uh, 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 for digitalization. So just to mention that in Geneva, where we try to organize some debate for the, the date uh, of the anniversary, but more than that, providing 
concrete uh, output which which could help really to let understand that multilateralism yes. it's not only in new york or yes. in the security council or in the you general assembly me? it's also basically uh, on a lot of issues which are very concrete and for instance in UNCTAD, maybe it's not well known but we are working on customs uh, digital preparedness of the countries um, on women and, and trade and how we can increase the women in, in STEM, all the technology discussion. So all those concrete projects are demonstration of the necessity, but also the concrete deliverables uh, of the UN. Uh, voilà, that's what I wanted to add at that stage. Thank you very much, Isabel. That really shows, I mean, this um, gap that is often pointed out between New York and Geneva. I mean, you just illustrated the example that if there is a political push that comes from New York, there's also a strong, very strong normative power that can be in Geneva and that the two are actually complementary. Uh, I don't know if we have Nathalie with us again. Uh, yes, Nathalie, how do you see that from your perspective? I mean, you've been there uh, throughout 2020 when uh, the UN was listening to the world. I think we still have some connection issues with Natalie. Maybe uh, uh, let me switch to Volker. Volker, you are the man in charge at the executive office on the whole implementation process of UN75. Tell us more about what the steps ahead look like. Well, thank you very much. And thanks again for organizing this event. I think it's very good that there is a focus and a bridge building between what the European Union does and, and in terms of its own iconic, uh, you, you know, I mean, in a way the European Union lives multilateralism on a daily basis. And, and it's obviously very much connected with the UN and a lot of things that are happening within the European Union converge very much with the type of things that, that we are undertaking. Perhaps just before I answer your question, Alex, I think it is important when we talk about multilateralism to really bear in mind that it affects the daily lives of people. And I think we really need to much more compellingly show that case, because whether it's we, whether we travel, whether we receive our mail, whether people in humanitarian crisis are able to get assistance and protection, I mean, this is due to effectively multilateralism. And actually the scorecard on what the UN has been doing since for the last 75 years is, is, an, is an incredible one when it comes to peace and security, avoidance of a major third world war, which was one of its purposes. The fact that we have a very robust human rights machinery that inspires people all around the world. The fact that we have decolonization and apartheid abolished as a result of UN efforts. The fact that we have uh, the sustainable development goals, that we have climate action. So there are a lot of achievements that I think we need to also bear in mind when we talk about the future of multilateralism. Now, concretely, UN 75, a massive listening exercise, 1.5 million people participated in it. There was a strong engagement and discussions with people all around the world. It is clear our main emphasis now is to make sure that the report that the Secretary General has to present on what is called the common agenda to address present and future challenges, that it really talks to the issues that people face all around the world, that it has a global perspective, that it talks about what you mentioned earlier, the social contract that we see in many instances, unfortunately broken. We see more and more protest movements. Uh, Christina mentioned also, um, you know, we see protest movements on gender equality, on racism, on, on climate action. The young people, women leaders come forward more and more. And we really need to capture that energy and make sure that we find a way at the national level to build and rebuild the social contract. But then at the international level, and the Secretary General has been very clear about this, what is it that we can do to make multilateralism more inclusive? more participatory, more networked, and more effective. And that's the big task that we have ahead of us to actually come up with some very concrete ideas. The Secretary General wants to have a manifesto of the future, of multilateralism of the future, and to really analyze how we can do much better. 
and we will not be able to do the optimal we should always try for the strive for the optimal but we also need to be bearing in mind current geopolitics and 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 some some frankly some dysfunctionalities that we also see in the political arena and really try to move ahead and forge a very different type of governance for the future that actually is able to respond much more effectively to the to the massive challenges that we face today. Over to you, Thank guys. you, Volker. Thank you. I think you perfectly set out the scene and we will get back to these concrete answers and solutions uh, to those challenges. But let us just dwell for a second on the challenges. Uh, although when you said it, I mean, it was clear in the massive poll of last year, uh, the UN image is a very positive or rather positive one, even and especially among young people, but across the world, especially with the people that benefit from the UN. So basically the cost of a non-UN would basically make the, wor the world a much worse place to stay in. But However, although this is true, there are, uh, there are some misachievements of the United Nations. The organizations and international organizations in general don't always manage to answer and tackle properly those challenges. Uh, as a result, the trust in the organizations themselves or in the legitimacy of those organizations has been diminishing. Um, how, how can we tackle that? How can we overcome this? How can the UN concretely act better uh, how can it communicate better about what it does? I mean, Christina, you've been in that role uh, at some point in your previous career. Um, how can it put those people that are the we, the peoples of the United Nations Charter, how can it put them back into the center? Um, who wants to go first for that? Isabel? Why not? Uh, yes, but that's really the challenge because uh, uh, the exercise to, to, to listen was of course key, but now we have to deliver. Uh, and, and it's true that um, when you look at the, the intergovernmental system, which is of course an addition of member states with divergence, uh, geopolitical uh, issues, etc., how could we adapt the system to really include those voices, those new groups? I think, of course, you, you, you mentioned uh, use, but not only use. Uh, it's also the question of uh, how do we listen to the protest? How do we listen to the cities, for instance? I know that for the SG, it's also something which is important because cities in everywhere in the world are a place where you can organize the things and the transition, uh, the, the ecologic transition, but also the, maybe the democratic transition differently. We know that the states are no longer the unique actor representing all the country. I, I didn't contest, of course, the election or the legitimacy of the of the elected government. Nevertheless, there was a lot of other players. And if you look at the digital world, for instance, yes, the countries are really uh, uh, without any any or with a very few capacity to regulate or to intervene in a sector which is managed by the private sector and, and especially by some big companies. So on all those things, we have to identify keeping the legitimacy of member states, uh, how we could not only consult regularly, but add a real, uh, uh, not only a voice, but a concrete participation of those, of those different entities. The other problem is that the new civil society, uh, you spoke that I'm a, uh, no, I know very well civil society. Yes, true. But today the civil society is no longer the usual suspect. I mean the organization and especially in the UN system and even in the European system, um, the think tank no, doing well uh, and providing analysis, etc. that's nice, but that's not exactly what is resonating in the society. The, the, the young generation for climate uh, and all other movements which are really totally different and they have the same mistrust in the civil, the organized civil society. And it's also the case on national level. So we have really to look how we can work with those groups which are not really well organized, but representing a new way to look at the, at the society, nation, regionally, nationally, but also uh, on, on the international level. And I think that it's a, there is a big paradox because uh, uh, all those new movements are feeling that multilateralism or international cooperation is absolutely key. Nevertheless, <laughs> uh, they are really not in capacity to really bring together their ideas, 
with the ideas of other groups because they are really uh, dedicated to some issues. So I think that with civil society and new movement in the society, we have to do more with the cities, with new partners, of course, with the private sector, but also in the private sector, how do we add, for instance, the startup, the new SMEs, uh, and not only the, the usual suspect in the big federation of private sector, which are of course important, but they are not really playing all the roles that we need in the recovery uh, or in the post COVID uh, period. Finally, I think that um, the system as such is a little bit <laughs> uh, bureaucratic, if I, if I can be a little, just uh, um, showing that we have probably to adapt or rules or way to work. It's a big organization. So of course it's difficult. Nevertheless, I think that we could simplify a lot of process of participation uh, in order to really give the, give the, the voice to, to people and try to build with them something as concrete project that they can really flag as UN project in my country, in my, in, in my, my region, uh, even sometimes in my, with my group, my group of gender, of youth or others, Yes, that's something that I receive from the UN. That would be a fantastic message. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for being so candid as well. I mean, I don't know, uh, Volker, if that uh, last remark of Isabel rings a bell. I mean, you're in the cockpit of the big organization, but you also come from a very efficient agency that has shown that uh, the UN can also be extremely flexible and adaptable. So are there any lessons learned maybe that you have taken from UNHCR and that would be good for the overall secretariat of, of, of the main flagship? You know, one of the most important lessons is really this people orientation. And it's a people orientation that, especially when the UN is present on the ground, is operationally engaged, has programs that delivers to people, that we are not doing it in an abstract way, but that we're doing it concretely, that we understand the needs of people, that we understand their rights, that we understand their aspirations. And the approach that we had in UNHCR, which I think is one that, that really rings very true in so many other contexts as well, is an age gender diversity approach, where we actually, whenever we spend money, whenever we program, whenever we operationalize our response, it was really important for us to analyze very well the people who we serve. And it means that you actually sit down with them, you understand you have feedback loops built in, you understand who they are. You don't see it as a homogeneous group of people. You actually see them and break it down into different age groups, men and women, boys and girls, people with disabilities, LGBTI, uh, people who belong to minority groups. So you actually try to understand what are their needs? What do they want? What do they want to achieve? How can we best respond through our support? And for instance, one of the big things that came out of this is to move away from traditional models of humanitarian assistance to cash assistance and to actually make sure that we understand the agency that people have, their resilience, even in, in extreme crisis situations and in conflict situations. And I think that's a real lesson. And it's what Isabel mentioned. It also de-bureaucratizes uh, what unfortunately often is a big issue that we have too much bureaucracy. Frankly, sometimes this bureaucracy also comes from member states because there are a lot of micromanagement that, that happens. But in order for us to be agile and flexible and nimble and respond to what people need and want, we need to adopt this approach of this people orientation. And there are lots of very good practices at the, on the, at the ground level, at the field level, at the country level, where we are able to respond in the most remote locations around, around this earth. And let's not forget, the UN is present in almost all countries around the world. Uh, and not just in capital cities, it is present in, in sometimes places that sometimes even people from their own country would not even know that they exist. And we are there and we are responding and, and we are trying to help and assist and serve people. Thank you, Volker. I think it, the, indeed it's important to, 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 to remember that the UN is not just the headquarters, but that it is uh, those who are actually acting in the field and that are making the world a better place. Uh, Christina, uh, from a member state's perspective, and maybe also with your background as a communications undersecretary general of the UN, uh, how could that communication, that overcoming of challenges maybe be improved? What should the UN be doing? Well, uh, I think the best communication is action. 
and delivery. And I think as a follow-up of what Isabel and Volker has mentioned, I'll, I would like to share with you some, some of our reflections of, in particular last year, uh, New York, Geneva. New York, uh, during COVID, uh, uh, rather stalled. Uh, the big geopolitical confrontation, the huge geopolitical confrontation really impeded the Security Council to operate well. The General Assembly was, uh, was uh, able to do certain things. Whereas if we went to Geneva, we saw the agencies uh, active, in particular, of course, uh, WHO, but also IOM, but also UNHCR, but also et cetera, et cetera. And what was more interesting for us is uh, the work of uh, the UN uh, teams on the ground. So uh, I think it's clear that uh, uh, um, the geopolitical stalemate had an impact in uh, how the UN was able to be organized. There was no uh, Security Council resolution on COVID until many months after. So I think this uh, probably has changed a little bit, uh, hopefully quite a bit, but we don't know yet, with the re-engagement of the United States. But I think what happened last year was quite paradigmatic of a major world crisis that needed the whole system to be truly operating. And it was uh, uh, probably, uh, you know, one part of, was more efficient than, than the rest. Second, I think we have to look at this year. And this year, the delivery and the proof for our citizens that the UN and the member states work and deliver is uh, uh, the uh, uh, extremely important agenda we have in front of us, health, vaccines. Vaccines are going to be the test that nobody is behind, is left behind. Second, the, um, the summit, the food security summit, very critical, and it's going to come um, sometime in the summer. Third, the Biodiversity Summit, another important uh, step of this year. And fourth, the climate meeting in, um, in Glasgow. So I think just looking at these huge themes, starting with health, vaccines, and following with the others, I think we member states uh, have to ensure that we bring at the table proposals, we commit to implement them, we bring at the table engagement, we raise uh, our obligations, and to me, this is the best communication for our international system that uh, if we didn't have it, we need to create something with as, lit as little bureaucracy as possible, but there is always a need of a bureaucracy, hopefully it's a good bureaucracy, but uh, Definitely the current agenda we have in front of us will not be realized unless we are all engaged. And I think this year can be the test that things can change. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Again, very action oriented. Natalie is back with us. I would like to give you a chance to share your thoughts on the previous question as well, but also on this one, and maybe uh, to be from a civil society point of view, uh, which you're representing here, very concrete as well about the remedies, the solutions, the concrete action that the UN uh, and the whole UN system could come forward in order to overcome these difficulties. Thank you, Alex, and apologies for the connection trouble. I'm joining you from the far remote, you know, location of London, so I don't know what, what happened Brexit. there. But um, I had, yeah, <laughs> I, no comment. Um, but uh, I had the privilege of working on the UN 75th anniversary last year. And I think, you know, one of my resounding takeaways from that is that we don't need to ask this question over and over again, is, is multilateralism needed? Is it relevant? Because quite simply, there is a demand for it. People want want global solutions, they want global cooperation, they see the need for it. I mean, what we did is we went out and asked people, what are your hopes and fears for the future? What are your expectations of multilateralism of the UN? And what are your solutions to the challenges that you face? What, what are you doing in your communities that could be scaled up, that we could support you with, that could be replicated and so on? We had over you know, 1.5 million people take part, millions more engaged, 60,000 organizations. And you know, they were they were pretty, you know, united in their view. 
it turns out that multilateralism is actually far more popular than, than populism in that sense. Um, I think, you know, it was really heartening to find that 75% of the people we asked um, said the UN was essential uh, to, to their future, to their uh, future security, their future prosperity, their future well-being. But there's a catch. It's not an entirely positive story. There's a huge mismatch, I think, between what people expect from the UN and what they perceive it as, as delivering, which builds on the points that were made about communications and uh, etc. And I think a lot of this is about inclusion. I mean, one of the roles I'm keen to take forward, uh, you know, now in civil society is really working on that bridge between the people and the UN. You know, we shouldn't have these consultations as one-off. We should build, as Volker said, on the best practices from the field uh, and, and institutionalize that. This, this should be part of the DNA. It shouldn't be something that is innovative to ask people what their hopes and fears are and, and to crowdsource solutions. It shouldn't be something that is controversial. Um, the pandemic has shown that we need a whole of society response. We need all sectors to work together. So I think that is for me really the, the, the core theme. You know, if you're looking at you know solutions and and what we can put forward, I mean the magic formula for everything is political will. I mean that is that is diff that is difficult you know to achieve and, and Isabel and others will you know can, can speak to that much better than, than I can. But um, I think, you know, communications, my, my take to add to what um, Christina said is we need to be much bolder and, and really embrace what we do. I think there's a tendency for us to go on the defensive as champions and proponents on multilateralism. Uh, I think, you know, a parallel I would draw is the debate around migration in Europe. You know, I am a Sri Lankan immigrant to Austria. I feel this very keenly. That that's my background, and I see that often we we cede the ground, we cede the debate to people who are you know maybe more extreme and 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 have kind of retrospective you know re retroactive views. Whereas actually, we should just say migration happens, multilateralism is needed. Let's focus a discussion on how we improve things and make it more more effective. You know, our outreach last year showed that there is no shortage of support. Um, and then the last point, you know, I, I think I want to make is, is inclusion is not just a buzzword. You know, we, we love to talk about partnerships. We love to talk about inclusion, but I think it is, it is a, a challenge in itself. If you look at one of the most profound changes over the last 75, now 76 years, yes, it's climate change. Yes, it's new technologies, but it's also the shift of power. Power is no longer just the preserve of states. It has flowed vertically, horizontally uh, to different geographic regions, but also to cities, to companies, to civil society movements. You have companies that have bigger GDPs than countries. You have influencers that can, you know, wipe the millions of the market. We need to, you know, really get to grips with the fact that our world is networked, but our UN system, our global system is very state centric. So right. if we are to, you know, to really address the challenges, we need to, 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 to really take forward the Secretary General's call for multilateralism to be more networked uh, and inclusive. It's not about, you know, us being more relevant. It's actually about being able to tackle the challenges that we face. Right, so a complex networking in, a, in an even more complex world. Uh, on, on those issues of partnerships and of reaching out to, to actors, uh, maybe it's time to, to, to move over to uh, questions from the audience because we do have a few. And one just fits perfectly in here, which uh, comes from Winston Dokeran. Winston is asking us uh, about microlateralism in this multilateralism, talking about small states. Uh, is there any concrete role for the smaller states to join in leading efforts by big ones? Because it's true that in the UN, we tend to talk may very much about the P5, and, but there's a whole General Assembly with uh, 196 member, 93 members behind. Uh, who wants to go first on that one? I will. Go ahead, okay. Isabel. So, yes, I, I thank you, Winston, for your question, because it's true that, for instance, for the moment, we are witnessing a big effort from the cities, the small island uh, countries. And they are really uh, doing a lot of efforts because they were uh, brutally affected by the COVID-19 uh, because of the stop of tourism and uh, the problem of uh, uh, climate change, the small states in the, in the ocean. So they really try to show something which is important for the UN is working about 
uh, or on the specific vulnerabilities of countries or groups of, of people. And I think that it's true that the situation of a group of young people in Barbados is not exactly the same that the young people in New York or, or in Addis Abeba. And I think that this, this approach through vulnerabilities is a way to show that uh, it's not only the GDP, of course, or not only the traditional categories, but we have to address some specific vulnerabilities in the small state island specifically, not only those one, but uh, especially those one are really very specific in their way to, to address the question of the recovery after COVID, et cetera. So I agree that we have probably in the multilateral system to develop a way which is not with category, but something which is more agile, more fluid regarding the, the specific vulnerabilities. And I think that it could help us to address specific problems of countries on another way. Of course, there are countries. So as a nation, they have a voice in the General Assembly, of course. But it's not enough because the, 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 this voice is very specific, one uh, on the 192. So it's important not only to have groups, but the vulnerabilities which could be shared between Barbados, but also another country with a different type of problems, but with a small size or a small voice in the debate. So I think that it's a way to work. And I give you another example. We are working now with some um, regional organization, economic regional organization. And we know, uh, we know of course, uh, uh, the biggest one, but small ones, for instance, uh, the economic union uh, in Eurasia. Uh, or the CARICOM, put together two regions, two small regions, and try to let them discuss which are the specific problems that they are facing, I think that it could be very useful and a little bit out of the traditional box that we, of, are, of that we have in the UN. Right, so shifting away from the member, member state-centric model. Uh, Volker, um, Christina, does that ring a bell? Any, any compliment to that question? Well, very uh, briefly, just to say that we have to take very seriously the needs of these smaller states and there are a number of um, of uh, uh, ways to do it and i think uh, in our case uh, spain partners with seeds on specific issues and i think we have to encourage more member states medium-sized member states uh, uh, others uh, uh, that uh, uh, you know do provide the support to bring to the attention their specific needs. Isabel uh, defined them very well. Their vulnerabilities are um, terrible, the Caribbean countries in terms of climate change or the impact of tourism, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, I think there is this word which is solidarity and then uh, uh, coming up front and supporting them in order to ensure that, that uh, their specific needs are identified and addressed. Thank you. Let me get to another question. We had a second question uh, from the floor. It was a question by Laurie, which I found very interesting in the light of what we've discussed in terms of bureaucracy, UN reform and involvement of civil society and other kind of stakeholder actors. The question is, in an organization that is funded through member states uh, and mandated through member states, uh, what are the ideas in terms of including non-state actors formally into the structures rather than giving them ad hoc structures, special envoys roles or special commission, which is always at the periphery of the system, but then the system remains very, very heavily member states oriented. Volker, any, any views on this maybe? Well, actually, you know, a number of governments in their delegations have now started to involve civil society representatives or young uh, representatives of, of youth movements, which is very good practice. And frankly, if you look at um, a lot of the intergovernmental processes, I think they are and they have opened up, although it's not enough, uh, they have opened up to a much more inclusive approach, uh, including with NGOs, uh, civil society representatives. Of course, when it comes to the operational agencies, agencies, funds and programs, it's absolutely clear that none of the work that UNHCR, that IOM, that WFP, that UNICEF does could be done without partners. I mean, there is a very strong partnership approach and frankly, civil society and a number of these operational agencies are hand in glove on, uh, on this because they wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. And I think that's yeah. very important. So. It's yeah. good to say it. It's good to know it. So thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Natalie, just a final on, from, your, from your point of view. 
Yeah, just a very quick comment. I mean, I actually wrote a very radical proposal a few years back about, you know, wouldn't it be great to open up the UN's membership so it included civil society and, you know, private sector actors. And it was really meant to spark a discussion. But, you know, we have a lot of models out there. You look at the ILO, you know, we're going back to 1919. And you have this tripartite decision making system that can be a bit slow in terms of getting to the decisions, but then implementation is quicker because you have all the actors on board and we have plenty of multi stakeholder models now. The Gavi, the vaccine alliance is, of course, really in the spotlight now. I think these are the sort of things we need to draw from. I think it'll be hard to change the formal structures. We all know how difficult that can be. But looking at an issue and forming some coalitions around that, I think that's a really interesting space to watch. Right, that's rather optimistic. It means it's possible. And let me turn to optimism. We have the answers to the questions that had been put forward. The first one was, how effective do you think the United Nations and multilateral organizations in general are in tackling major global challenges? I think we've, you've answered this in this panel. The answer from the audience is 75% think they are fairly effective. Nobody says very effective but nobody says not effective at all. So it's uh, three quarter, one quarter, 75 fairly, 25 rather not effective. So that's rather a good sign. And to the second question to the panel, which was uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the audience, what do you think the United Nations and multilateral organizations in general should focus on to be more effective? 22%. Uh, say that multilateral organizations should concentrate on what they've been created for and just stick to that, in this case, the UN Charter, without involving. And 78% say that, of course, organizations should evolve with their time, with their circumstances, and get become more inclusive. Um, it's time to wrap up our session. Uh, as a word of conclusion, I would like each of you, in two words, maybe three, just tell me your vision of the UN of 2045 when the UN will be 100. What kind of UN do you want? What kind of UN do we need? Isabel, three words. Uh, uh, open UN and uh, with a lot of new coalition. Christina? Uh, effective, addressing the real needs of the population. And uh, let me go back to the origin and what Dark Hammarskjöld said, uh, which is um, an imperfect uh, organization, but indispensable. A hundred years after its creation, the United Nations would be as indispensable as it is now. At the same okay. time, we, the member states, would have to be more focused to ensure it is more efficient. Natalie, in three words, literally. <laughs> A truly global partnership. And Falker, what is your? What are your three words? the champion of the future a happy place where where things can be discussed and where we can see a future that is actually working for all of us so i think sorry there, there was a bit of a calling very good there. i mean on this very happy note thank you very much thanks to our wonderful panelists you've been fantastic uh, discussing those very important issues i hope that put some appetite for more un issues uh, in the audience that's been following us uh, stay with us the uh, state of the union is continuing and we are looking forward also to see you all in person in firenze for the 11th edition in 2022 bye-bye <laughs>